It was a pioneer and leader in computer multitasking, high-end graphics, and shockingly good audio available at a retail level. It was sold to Commodore, who then proceeded to sit on that technology for years. They dabbled, but ultimately fell flat in their attempts to maintain the original astronomical lead they had over their competition. And the rest is history. When the Amiga was launched to consumers in 1985, it came with an innovative, efficient, and user-friendly operating system. And the Amiga OS was a very distinctive Commodore Blue. By 1987 in the United States, with the release of the much more economically attractive Amiga 500 and powerfully expandable Amiga 2000, software companies were climbing over each other to get a piece of that quickly expanding market. It wasn't until 1990, however, before Commodore made any significant commercial updates to the Amiga's OS. As a result, the entire software market for over four years was directly aimed at Amiga OS 1.2 and 1.3 and the millions of machines that used it. Thus, as Commodore slowly rolled out version 2.0 in 1990 with the release of the Amiga 3000, most commercial software still fully supported OS 1.3 while they began to dip their toes into the 2.0 waters. While many might argue 2.0 brought a more professional user interface standard to the Amiga, the fact is OS 1.3 was the most popular Amiga operating system for years for software developers to target due to its large installed user base in several countries around the world, including the United States. This explains why, even by the time Commodore died in 1994, many games and software titles still had a base requirement that closely mirrored a stock A500's environment dating back seven years. It just made financial sense to cast the widest net and, except for some later high-end productivity and graphics packages, most software worked just fine on top of 1.3's architecture. The titles that target A1200s and A4000s AGA 3.0 plus machines withered on the vine, except in some very localized markets and industries at a time when the ultimate fate of Commodore had already been obvious to many for years. In 2021, I like to remember the history of where Amiga came from when its future was the brightest. I like to relive the experience many pre-1992 Amigans actually shared when they turned their machines on for the very first time and loaded up Defender of the Crown, or Monkey Island when the games were brand new to the world. And most people saw Old Blue. The other thing about the Amiga scene that has always been so amazing is the insanely active developer scene it inspired and fostered. Thanks to Fred Fish, user groups, BBSs, and cover discs, public domain software provided free or inexpensive high-quality programs for thousands of people around the world to enhance their Amiga experience. If I wanted to, I could create a monster Amiga with millions of colors and shockingly modern comforts. And that could be a very fun way to go in this never-ending, wonderful hobby of retro computing that we all love. But for me, I generally prefer using the Amiga the way I originally saw it the first time and like to live in the world where legacy original Amiga software simply works. So what I'd like to do next is demonstrate some of my personal favorite software that was designed and developed on and for Amiga OS 1.3 that makes the old environment a ton of fun to use even to this day. The programs I'm going to demonstrate includes the following. Amadoc, Dopus, WShell, Zoom Demon, My Menus, QMouse, SimGen, Hippo Player, WordPerfect Library, and 64Door. These are not going to be deep dive tutorials, but more high level elevator pitches of my favorite aspects of each and why they make my old Amiga 1000 such a simple joy to use while keeping its original identity intact. Amadoc. There are a few programs I install on all of my Amigas now and have them launch when I boot the machines. One is an iconified view of directory opus. The other is Amadoc. Amadoc is a little customizable strip along the bottom or side of your screen 
that lets you launch apps of your choice with the click of a button. It was created by Gary Knight in 1991 and was inspired by the next dock he saw on those machines. You can create your own icons to launch apps. And if you don't want to do that, several people in the past created sheets of icons in Deluxe Paint for you to pull from. The way it works is you actually load Deluxe Paint brush files rather than IFF or other standard image files to be used as icons in the Amadoc. You can add or reduce the dock to whatever size you like and load it up with your favorite programs you use the most often. Having been released in 1991, it supports both non-interlace old blue icons as well as interlace 2.0 glorious gray icons, as well as multicolor palettes if you happen to go that route. Dopus 4.1. Most everyone knows Directory Opus, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this exceptional file manager program. I will say this though, by 1994, the very fact that Commodore hadn't licensed or built their own comparable GUI-based tool for people to perform the most basic tasks of file management is appalling. And one more sad example of how Commodore was completely oblivious to market and technology trends. They basically pressed play on a music CD player for Apple and Microsoft to do the floss right on top of their grave. And let's not talk about CD players either. Later versions of Dopus were so full featured they allowed you to virtually embed them as the default file manager into Amiga OS since it didn't have one for itself. For me, I prefer the simplified view of 4.1 to move most of my data around, even when I'm using OS 3.1. It is bone dead easy to understand and stunningly robust in its feature set. WShell 2.0 One of the most glaring differences between OS 1.3 and later versions is the built-in command line interface and shell. When you're in 1.3 land, you lack some of the most basic UI tools that its later cousins earned at birth. For starters, to close the window, you have to type end CLI. There's no close gadget to click on and kill the window. On top of that, if you perform a list command and the results are long, you have to issue a page break to stop them and start them up again. There are no scroll bars. In 1988, William S. Hawes out of Maynard, Massachusetts, released a much enhanced yet highly compatible replacement for the Amiga's CLI. He went on to improve the program up to version 2.0 in 1991, which continued to support both OS 1.3 and 2.0. For 1.3 users, it provided the close gadget and those beautiful scroll bars all the other kids had. But WShell can do so much more. You want more? Well, how about file name completion? Type the first few letters of a long file and hit escape and it'll finish the typing for you. It is also full of function key magic like window minimizing and maximizing and Z depth ordering. You can highly customize it to your own taste and style from how the C prompt works all the way down to creating custom aliases for common commands you may perform. If you ever wish the shell could do a particular thing or could be customized a certain way, chances are, it can be with WShell 2.0. Zoom Demon. Zoom Demon is a program that attaches a zoom gadget to each intuition window, which causes the window to expand to the full size of your screen or contract the window's minimum size when it is pressed. Once the Zoom Demon is running, new windows that are open may include a zoom gadget, which should appear to the left of the depth gadgets in the upper right hand corner of the window and it will only add itself to any window that was designed to be resized in the first place. It's that feature you always kind of wanted on an Amiga and you simply forgot about it until the day you got it back. My Menus. My Menus is yet another feature enhancement for the Intuition interface that is both extremely powerful and cool. It allows you to create your own custom menus along the top of your workbench. You can add any workbench or CLI program to one or more menus, and menus can have multiple levels if you really want to get crazy. Since I have some of my most common permanent programs already assigned to my Amadoc along the bottom of my screen, I decided to make a My Menu for games. I also added no fast mem to my menu since I use that command every time I fire up Rogue, one of my all-time favorite games, which I actually finally beat last year. And what's even cooler is I can assign an Amiga keystroke to each menu item, 
So for example, as soon as I boot the machine, I can slap AP and fire up pools of darkness without even opening my eyes or drilling down into drawers. QMouse. QMouse is an amazing piece of software where its only obvious limitation is its name. It does so much more than affect your mouse. At its most basic though, it is a mouse accelerator. If you've got a tank mouse or other old rollerball mouse, it will change it to feel as slick and smooth and accurate as an optical mouse. The moment it activates, and I have mine launched during boot up, the difference is dramatic and very obvious. The developer, Mr. Lyman Epp of Omaha, Nebraska, must have been terrified of screen burn when he wrote the program back in 1989. Because after boot up, if you don't move your mouse, the pointer will disappear after a few seconds. Wait a couple of minutes and your screen blanks too, giving you a very handy and literal screensaver. It also provides automatic window activation by just moving your mouse over a window. No more clicking. And you can use the mouse buttons anywhere in a window to push it backwards and forwards rather than use the window gadgets. QMouse also provides a tiny clock and RAM counter, customized hotkeys, keystroke recorders, and of course, all of this is highly configurable and able to be launched on boot up. SimGen. Ever feel a twinge of jealousy when you saw some of the other Amigas around town sporting fancy background images on their workbench? Well, feel that way no more with SimGen brought to us by Greg Tavares out of San Francisco, California, who, quote, I wasted two nights writing it back in 1989. SimGen displays a two or four color IFF picture behind your workbench. If the IFF picture is a digitized picture, it looks much like a Genlock display, hence the name SimGen for simulated Genlock, as the background image will bleed through normal workbench windows like the shell, producing a really cool effect. SimGen adds one or two bit planes to your workbench screen and loads the specified picture into these bit planes. Then it sets the colors for the desired effect. SimGen takes about 25K to run and another 16 to 64K for the picture it loads. It won't play nice with any machines running eight or 16 color palettes. The performance hit is not noticeable. In fact, other programs like DropCloth or simply using more colors will generate more of a performance hit than this will. SimGen adds colors to the Workbench's display, but it doesn't need to tell Workbench about it. So Workbench thinks it's still using only four colors and therefore performs better. Hippo Player. Like Directory Opus, Hippo Player will be very familiar to most viewers of this channel. It is easily one of the most recognizable music players on the Amiga. What many may have forgotten though, is that it was developed specifically for OS 1.2 and higher on an Amiga 500. It is a multi-format module player that works on any Amiga model and offers tons of features while not being very resource heavy. In other words, you can very easily multitask with it in most circumstances. If you're using visualizer scopes while listening, they do perform better if you have a mild accelerator at the ready. But an accelerator is by no means required to use Hippo Player to listen to eye-wateringly great music on your Amiga. WordPerfect Library. WordPerfect was a big name professional word processor that was ported to Amiga. And there's no shortage of excellent word processors and text editors for OS 1.3. But a lesser known standalone piece of software that WordPerfect Corporation also created was Library and was later renamed to WordPerfect Office back in 1986. Take that, Microsoft. It's basically a very simple and well-designed calendar scheduler. You can create data signed memos, appointments, and to-do lists and see those tasks populate your GUI calendar view. If some brilliant programmer out there found a way to hook this into my Google Calendar, I might die from crying. I'm not holding my breath that will ever happen, but it's fun to dream. You never know in the Amiga community, you know what I mean? 64 door. Instead of Facebook, I get my social media fix by hitting BBSs on an almost daily ritual. I actually visit BBSs that are being run off of Commodore 64s and C128s. 
which means they're pumping out Petsky graphics for those that can see them properly. It turns out someone made a Petsky-capable terminal program for the Amiga called 64-Door back in the day, and it pumps out those BBSs as well or better than can be seen from the Amiga's 8-bit cousins. It does prefer OS 1.3 to run, however, but does work fine with Wi-Fi modems and can be installed to hard drives. So, is 1.3 as powerful and slick as some of the modern enhancements made beyond 3.0? Not right out of the box, it isn't, no. But there is so much that can be done to enhance the original experience, and it does do quite a lot more than some give it credit. Oh yeah, then of course there's over 95% of all Amiga games ever made. OS 1.3 eats games for breakfast and asks for seconds. There's a lot more 1.3 has to offer for the pre-1992 era machines, and for me, that's a place I like to spend my time. There is a literal treasure trove of it to be found in both the Fredfish archives as well as Aminet and SourceForge. For the computer archaeologists out there like myself looking for some hidden treasures in the deepest waters of Old Blue. So remember guys, keep that Amiga love flowing and we'll see you next time. Bye bye. I want to thank the following members of AmigaLove.com for helping me discover and fall in love with some of the software we looked at today. Amiga Love.